That city of the new Jerusalem. Oh, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by. How the ransom singers will together lift that hymn. Oh, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by. We're singing, oh, what joy. When we get home, oh, we're going to rest beneath that cloudless storm. In that land, oh, where saints never die, oh, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. In that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly blend. Oh, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Gone will be our sadness, pleasures there will never end. Church, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by we're singing oh what joy when we get home oh we're gonna rest beneath that cloudless dome in that land oh we're saints Never die, church. We're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Victory and love will be our everlasting thing. Oh, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream. Oh, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. We're singing, oh, what joy when we get home. Oh, we're going to rest beneath that cloudless dawn in that land yes in that land where saints never die church we're gonna sing hallelujah sing hallelujah by and by we're singing oh what joy when we get home oh we're gonna rest beneath we're going to rest beneath that cloudless dome in that land. Yes, in that land where saints never die. Oh, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. We're singing, oh, what joy, oh, what joy when we get home oh we're gonna rest beneath we're gonna rest beneath that cloudless storm i'm talking in that land yes in that land where saints never die church we're gonna sing hallelujah sing hallelujah by oh with oh what joy Oh, what joy when we get home. Oh, we're going to rest beneath. We're going to rest beneath that cloudless storm. In that land, yes, in that land where saints never die. Church, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, bye. And bye. Amen and amen. amen. I like a cold Christian. 
And y'all will stay crisp and awake because that coldness is going to keep you awake this morning. There'll be no sleeping in here today. <laughs> I'm thankful that y'all all decided to stay and brave the cold, that you all decided to stay and get a word from the Lord. There is a word from the Lord this morning. And if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And the Bible reads, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. So this morning, I got caught between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I wanted to say something to y'all that would entail both. And I saw it hard and long. I said, Lord, give me, give me something to help both people. Because you do know this time of the year is not cheerful for everybody. Yeah. Everybody's not as happy as you. Some stories I heard this week from some of you. Some of you, this is your first Christmas. This was your first Thanksgiving without your mother or without your father. So I want to take some time to talk about God makes space for misfits. God makes space for misfits. I'm going to use a line of this poem by a woman named Susan Best. Uh, I want to use the stanza of that poem to underline someone in the scripture and some in here this morning who is in the world's eyes a misfit. Now, I love Christmas and Thanksgiving. I love the smells. I love the sights. I love the sounds. I like the season of Thanksgiving and Christmas. And everything about this season brings me back to home. And that's why when I lived in Georgia, I always had to get on a plane and come back home. Because I remember my mother and my grandmother and what they taught us. And so every time these seasons come, the first thing that comes to my mind is home. And then I, I like Charlie Brown and Lucy. <laughs> yeah, I like Snoopy and Linus. I don't miss how the Grinch stole Christmas. Uh, but I, I like the song, you know, but uh, I really like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I like the song, but I like the show because Rudolph and Yukon, uh, Cornelius, they end up on the island of misfit toys. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw it, you would even say it glows. And then all of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They wouldn't let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. Yeah, you, you, you know how it goes. All before, they couldn't stand Rudolph. Talked about his red nose. But when Santa, when Santa noticed him and brought him up front and let him be the head reindeer, everybody loved him. It's a, the story says it shouted out with glee. And then there's an elf on the show as well. And uh, he doesn't want to make toys, but he wants to be a dentist. There's some toys with one eye missing, with one arm missing. And there's an island full of misfit toys. This is a church full of misfit toys. Nothing in your background says you ought to be here this morning. Y'all don't hear me. Well. 
But thank God for grace. The Bible tells me that every day I get up, I get new mercies. God gives me new mercies. Not some recycled mercy, but new mercies, the Bible tells me. Thank God for the incarnation that when when we don't fit in anywhere else, Christ came to fit us in. Now the poem by Susan Best says, that night when in Judean skies the mystic star dispensed its light, a blind man moved in sleep and dreamed he had sight. Sight. Seeing. Helen Keller said, there is, there is none so blind as he who has sight but no vision. It's a, dreadful, it's a dreadful thing to be in church, have a Bible, go to Sunday school, and still have no vision. God is moving all around us. God is still blessing. God is still providing. God is still making a way. And every, everybody around you can see it but you. Look at the text. This, this, this story is only in the Gospel of Mark. It's a miracle of a man who is blind. He was not born blind, as as was another man in John's gospel. He was not blind from his mother's birth. He was born seeing, but he lost his sight. Some of us have had our eyes opened by the gospel, but we have lost our sight. And so his friends bring him to Jesus, and they want Jesus to touch him. But rather than touch him, Jesus does something that is peculiar only to this miracle. This is the only time Jesus touches anybody twice. Mm -hmm. This miracle is really a parable in action because not only is Jesus doing something for the man, but he's teaching his disciples. So not only does Jesus touch him, but I need you to see the preparation for his healing. Before Jesus can heal him, Jesus does something that he has never done before. And he takes the man away from the crowd. He takes him outside the village of Bethsaida. He takes him out by himself, but he takes him by the hand. And sometimes we can't hear Christ till he gets us by ourselves. You can't hear Christ when the children is running all back and forth through the house. You can't communicate with him then. Sometimes he got to take you by the hand. Brothers and sisters, there's something to be said about taking somebody by the hand. When we greet each other, we shake hands, which is a form of greeting, you know, uh, saying, how are you, how are you doing, without going into a whole lot of words. A handshake speaks a whole lot. But when I'm in trouble, when my heart is broken, when my soul is weary, I need more than a handshake. I need somebody to hold my hand. Because when you're lonely, it makes a difference when somebody holds your hand. When you're sick, it makes a difference when somebody holds your hand. When you've lost a loved one, uh, it warms your heart when somebody holds your hand. Now, Jesus not only touched them, but he took them by the hand. And we're not going to get people saved until we take them by the hand. Let me say that again. We're not going to get people saved until we take them by the hand. Because the human touch is more than just a pat on the back. It's walking with them till they get it right. I have to be careful right here because in this climate of sexual harassment, you can't tell a woman you look good today without some connotation that that's not what you intended. You can't befriend a woman or a man unless you're sleeping together. That's the culture we live in. So you have, to be, you have to keep people at arm's length because if you don't, you might be under, misunderstood. Amen. And because you might end up like Russell Simmons or some of these other people or someone like that because everything now can be easily misrepresented. But as a child of God, if your intentions are right, when I'm in trouble, I need somebody to hold my hand. I need somebody to hold my hand. I need somebody to walk with me in my stuff. 
I don't need you to stay away from me. I need you to lead me around some stuff that you can't lead me around unless you hold my hand. Shaking my hand and walking away is not going to help me through my darkness at night. I need you to stay there and hold my hand in the midst of my misery. I'm glad that when I was in the hospital, I had people to hold my hand. I'm glad I had my wife to hold my hand. And I'm glad because I'm really, really honored this morning because the nurse that held my hand is here this morning. Jesus teaches something in this text that he doesn't teach in any other passage of Scripture. He takes the man by the hand and takes him away from everybody because there is a thin line. There is a line we have to learn how to handle between ostentation on one hand and self-revelation of faculty on the other. When you know, when you know how to do something, humility makes you keep it undercover. But isn't it strange that folk who, know, who don't know how to do anything make most noise? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but folk who know how to do stuff, you have to get it out of them. You have to dig it out of them because when you really know that you know that you know, you don't have to show off because the cream will just rise to the top. If you're loud and boisterous and always pushing yourself, that's a deep-seated insecurity. Yeah, Yeah, that's a deep-seated insecurity. But when you know you can do whatever it is you can do, they got to beg you or ask you, uh, pull it out of you because you're afraid of ostentation. And ostentation is wanting to be seen. Wanting to be applauded. Wanting to be recognized. See, when I know the talents that most of the people in here, they don't go around flaunting them. I know what their talent is. And when I need it, I call upon them. When you can do what God has given you to do, you don't have to brag about it. You will be recognized. Just like when you have a Christian walk. I was talking to a man in the paint store for five minutes, and he said, you talk like you've been saved. I didn't go around telling him, I'm a Christian. When... Your light shines, people can see it. You don't have to put up one of these. You don't have to advertise. But you got to walk, you know, and if you do it for that reason, for that applaud, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You got to walk a thin line between pride and humility. Between pride and humility. You know, this is what I believe about the football player, Tom Brady, who divorced his wife, or they divorced each other. She asked him, at 40 years old, to stop playing football. But his pride, he could not part with those people yelling his name, the locker room, the rah-rah. He could not part with that. And he had to choose between that or his family. And you do see him playing on Sundays, don't you? Jesus takes this man outside the village to prepare him for the healing because Jesus doesn't want any undue attention because he wants to deal with this man one-on-one. And brothers and sisters, I think that's how we're going to fill this church or, or save this community. I think that's how we're going to save the city because by dealing with people one-on-one. Stop being afraid to touch somebody. Stop being afraid to be in people's lives, befriend and contact people. There's no reason why a sister came in here, and she's been here for quite some time. And I bet you all of seven people only know who she is. I was the first one. I bet you only seven people know who she is. It's no reason why everybody in here don't know who everybody in here is. Why you still got people sitting over there and you don't even know who they are? Why is that? Why is that? Don't be afraid to touch somebody. 
and contact people because you're not going to win them standing away from them. Stop sitting on the pew by yourself and go get somebody else to sit with you. Stop praising God by yourself. Get somebody else with you to praise God. Because you got to get individual with people. And Jesus made a point of taking this man by the hand to take him away from everybody to deal with him one-on-one. And that's how we have to deal with one another. You have to put yourself in the other person's place. And stop being saved and forgetting about everyone who's lost. Because one day, you was lost. Hello, somebody. One day, you was lost. And somebody got, in, got you in contact with Jesus Christ. And if somebody got you in contact with Christ, you ought to get somebody else in contact with Christ. When was the last time that you witnessed to somebody? See how quiet you got there? I know, you, I know you're saved. I know you belong to the church of Christ. I know you go to church on Sunday. But when was the last time you did what God said to do. Go in the hedges and highways and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. See, don't holler loud in here and don't holler loud out there. Tell somebody out there, I know a man from Galilee. If you in sin, he can set you free. Jesus took this man by the hand, made contact with him, stayed with him, Till he got it right. Then when they got to the outside of the city after the preparation for the healing, look at the process of the healing here. Jesus did something to him that would offend most of us. He spit in his eye. I see some of y'all getting mad right now. <laughs> that's offensive. In this culture, that's offensive. To spit in somebody's eye. For somebody to spit on you, let alone in your eye, that's a fight. If somebody accidentally spit on me, talk back to me if you can. I wish somebody would spit on me. (laughs) I, I hear you talking. And spit in my eye? Oh, heck no. We're going to fight about that. We're going to fight about that. But I want you to get it right now. I want you to understand what I'm saying. In that culture, they believed that saliva had medicinal purposes, medicinal properties. So as a matter of fact, now you, some of y'all may not admit this, but when you cut your finger, you put your finger in your mouth. Somebody ought to help me here. I know plenty of people cut their finger and put their finger in their mouth right away. I ain't the only one. And, and in a second or so, you know when you put your finger in your mouth and you cut your finger? In a second or so, the blood stops. Because there must be some medicine in the saliva. Now, Jesus spits in the man's eyes to heal him. And when he spit in his eyes, Jesus said, do you see anything? And the man said, I see men but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus leaves the spit alone and touches his eyes and says, what do you see now? And the man says, I see everything clearly. And this is the only time that Jesus does something twice in order to heal. Now, what is Jesus trying to tell us? I'm glad you asked. Because sometimes salvation illumination is gradual. Sometimes you don't get saved right away. Sometimes it takes years for you to get saved. Sometimes you have to hear preaching over and over and over, and then finally the gospel makes sense. Let me see if I can help you. Some people have a testimony of being delivered from drugs or delivered from almost being killed or or delivered from some dreaded sickness or they have been delivered from alcohol addiction and they have been through a whole lot. They've been shot at, beat up, in jail, dogs chased them, run over by a car and they survive all of that 
and they come to church and they get saved. And we hear that testimony and it's so graphic and, and so instructive that when we hear all of that, we say, wow, I must not be saved. I didn't go through all of that. But God works with each of us individually. Some folk got to go to jail to be saved. Some people got to get shot before they will come to Christ. Sometimes you got to lose before you can win. Now, this is the segment of the sermon when I got to talk to a certain type of person in here. The holiday season is not always cheerful for everyone. Well. Now, now, some of y'all came in here this morning and everything is all right. About two of y'all here today. <laughs> two of y'all in here today that walked in with nothing on your mind but thank you, Jesus. Oh, oh, but the rest of us, no matter how hard you try to, hold, try to hide it, how deep you conceal it, some of us came into church with some stuff on our minds. Well. I, I got some problems that, I haven't, that haven't been resolved. I got some sickness I'm worried about. I got some issues that are circling around me. My job is in jeopardy. My children are crazy. My marriage is messed up. My money is funny. And if the truth be told, I'm on the brink of crying. But because I'm around y'all Babylonians, I got to shout out and holler when all I really want to do is cry. I want to suggest to you that in sincere worship, God accepts weeping as much as praising. In sincere worship, God accepts weeping as much as praying, praising. Weeping expresses a vulnerability in the presence of God. That is an acknowledgement of God's ability to heal. I'm here, God, because I need you to heal what hurts. I need you to bind what's broken. I need you to comfort what's confused. I need you to hold what's tearing me apart. God, here I am. I'm vulnerable to you. That I will do for you what you would never do in your cubicle for your coworker. I can't let them see me cry. Can't let them know that everything, everything that's going on. But in the house of God, I can expose myself. Okay, let me try to help y'all. A, a few months back, I went to the doctor to, uh, for my annual physical. I'm sitting there, and they take my blood pressure. My blood pressure is fine. Weight was all right. Go in the waiting room, and I'm fine. Then I go to the examination room, and I'm fine. As the nurse leaves, she says, take your clothes off. I don't want to take my clothes off. I'm fine. My blood pressure is fine. My weight is fine. No need to take my clothes off. So she left. She came back and opened the door, and I hadn't taken my clothes off. She said, Mr. Graves. I said, Minister Graves, I'm not taking my clothes off. I'm not sitting in this room no more. My blood pressure is fine. My weight is fine. I feel fine. I'm not taking off my clothes. No, I'm leaving. She said, listen, the doctor won't see you until you take your clothes off. So if you want the doctor to really deal with you, you can't sit in here and be all clothed and really want the doctor to deal with you. You have to take off everything that is hiding what's underneath you and just expose yourself for who you are. I'm talking to somebody who comes in here every Sunday and says, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And the Lord says, no, you got to expose yourself. 
You got to deal with your pain. You got to expose the realities of your life. And it doesn't always mean you shout. Sometimes it means you cry. That's for my people who had a rough Thanksgiving. They're going to have a rough Christmas. Missing their mother, their father, their aunt or their uncle, or their sibling. That's for you. I hope you got something out of that segment. But some of us just come to Sunday school, just come to Bible study, just was raised in a Christian home, and we didn't go through a whole lot of stuff. We got it right away. I hope I'm helping somebody this morning. Don't, sh- don't shout on somebody else's testimony. Get a testimony of your own. And you don't have to go through what they went through. But if God just saves you gradually, then praise God for graduated salvation. Because it's not about the experience. It's about grace. Because he doesn't have to save anybody. He takes the man out and says, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees walking. But Jesus says, I got to get that straight. Because, see, if you see men as trees, you're going to climb on them. If you see men as trees, you're going to start chopping them down, cutting off some of their limbs, bringing them down to your size. I got to get your sight straight because until you see men as creations of God, you'll never go out of your way to help them to get saved. Until you see men and women as your equal, you will never go out of your way to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. As long as you think you're better than the person standing next to you, you'll never invite them to Christ. As long as you don't see them as your equal. That's what I like about Christ. He liked to go where the misfits were. He didn't go where the people that was high and mighty and sanctified. He went where the people was misfits. The blind man didn't fit into society. The woman with the blood issue didn't fit into society. The woman at the well, she didn't fit into society. The man laying there on his bed by the water, by the pool, he didn't fit into society. These are the people Christ goes to. The ones that most of us will step over or step around are the ones that Christ wants to be found. Sometimes you don't have to go through all that stuff. You can just get it right away. That's why I like preaching at this church, because you get it right away. (laughs) You, You really understand it. You understand if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, my enemy would have gotten the best of me. You get it. You know if the Lord had not opened the door, if God had not rescued you, you would be dead and in your grave. I love preaching to folk who got it before I give it to them. He had to bring him out so he could bring him in. Sometimes God has to bring you out so he can bring you in. Sometimes God has to hurt you before he can heal you. He has to break you before he can bless you. He has to knock you down before he can raise you up. Because there are some things you can't see until God shows them to you. What do you see? Jesus asked. He asked this a second time to let us know that if you don't get it the first time, he will stick with you until you do. I'm glad I got a God who never gives up on me. So as I close... Every morning, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Every morning, when you wake up and see a sunrise, that's Jesus spitting in your eye. Every tragedy you ever came through, that's Jesus spitting in your eye. Every baby he has let be born into your family, that's Jesus spitting in your eye. Every sickness that he rescued you from, that's Jesus spitting in your eye. Talk back to me. Tanya knows about it. Tanya knows about Jesus spitting in her eye. Yeah. I know when I was laying on that hospital bed, I know about Jesus spitting in my eye. I know. 
I know. Not to insult you, but to get you to shout a minute. Because when God does something you don't expect, you ought to give God some unexpected hallelujah. And you know what else? Spit some more grace. Some more mercy. Some more blessings. When he touched him the second time, he said, I can see clearly. And since, since Jesus touched me, I can see clearly. The road was thorny and cloudy before. But since Jesus touched me, I can see clearly. Some of us are as blind as we want to be right now. And you need Jesus to spit in your eye so that you can see clearly. Some of us, it's like he's saying, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to wake up? Listen, this. I know a lot of us think that we're fine the way that we are. But Jesus has a better way for you to be. God wants to remake you into who you should be. I know you think you are who you should be. But your plan ain't God's plan. God said, I have a plan for you that supersedes your plan. And you need to do like this man. He was obedient to Christ. When Christ was getting ready to spit his eyes, he didn't say, oh, wait, wait a minute now. What, what you getting ready to do? I'm not sure I'm with that. He had an active, positive response to Jesus. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you ought to have an active, positive response to the word of God. Amen. How can you become a child of God? The Bible says you got to hear the word because Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then you must believe. You must believe. Hebrews 11, 6. He that comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then you got to repent. You got to do that, that 160, 180. You got to stop doing those things that are against God's word. You got to turn your life around. You got to make a conscious effort. I'm going to stop doing it. And then you got to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That's the only confession that can put you in heaven. Because if you deny him, he said, he, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. You don't make that confession. See, it's, the Bible says that every tongue shall bow. Every tongue will confess. It's whether you do it now or later. The problem is when you do it later, you will be separated from God for all eternity. Because after you make that confession, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because we all got free will. We all got free will. God doesn't have us as robots. You can obey him now or you can obey him later. But the consequences later, you won't like you won't like. And then you got to be baptized. Why? For the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when you come up out that water you'll be a new creature. You won't be the same person that went down in there. You'll be a new creature the Bible says. That's the only way you can put on Christ is through the water. See, I can't become a Christian being a Catholic because they only sprinkled some water on my head. But the Bible says baptism is a full submersion and full burial. And, 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 and that one distressing thing I found out, and I was sad to find out, that some people maybe sitting in this very room are hung up about this tongue speaking. This tongue speaking will not get you into heaven. Amen. Number two, it's not a requirement. Amen. And number three, unless you got an interpreter, the Bible says you must keep silent. Amen. Three things. Talking in tongues does not make you any closer to God than I am right now. Well. Not closer. Y'all need to let that stuff go. Because you're going to hold on to that and run yourself to hell. You better let go of what, let, God said that tongue speaking has ceased. 
if he said it ceased, you ought to be smart enough to listen to him and let it go. Who are you going to oppose God and say, I'm going to keep doing it anyway? You know what that's like? That's like saying, you know you're about to sin and you ball up your fist and say, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. There's a lot of stuff God needs us to stop. Because when you go into heaven, there's no baggage check. There's no baggage claim. You can't take none of that with you. You better check that stuff here because it won't be allowed up there. If you're a Christian, you've fallen by the wayside, you've been neglecting your duties, you need to come down and repent this, this morning because we don't know when our, next, our last breath is. Christ said, if you die in your sins where I am at, you cannot come. So you come down here and get your business straight with God right now. Don't let Satan hold you back like he told you, oh, it'll be all right. You come down here and get your business straight with God because he's the only one to have a heaven and hell to put you in. I don't, but he does. But when you're obedient, you don't have to worry about that. When you're obedient to the word of God, you don't have to worry about that. We're going to sing a stanza of a song, and you come whatever side you find yourself on this morning.